Thank you, and thank you for the introduction, uh, the invitation to come and speak with you today. Um, I'm going to try to keep this relatively brief for the, um, in the schedule, but I want to, at the same time, introduce you, uh, or to introduce, talk a little bit about this, uh, the stack, this book we just published last, uh, last month at MIT Press. It's uh, 500 pages in 20 minutes, so we'll see if we can get through this. But, um, you know, philosophy end up not working, it's at least you can weaponize it in other, other more direct <laughs> more direct ways than this is as well. Um, the work, just very briefly, is sort of a is in very interdisciplinary, sort of a mix of geopolitics, design theory, and computer science. Um, it's also a mix of, of kind of analytical, theoretical work, and, and something that I think of as more of a kind of multi-scalar uh, infrastructural design brief um, that's meant to be uh, responded to more directly. It, it also is meant to propose, in a way, a kind of model of totality of, of, of a big picture of the whole, something we've perhaps not so good at um, anymore. Um, and it's also, at least within the, the sp specific problem of political science um, in relation to some of the things that Meta Haven is dealing with in this book, who also did the cover, by the way. Um, political science, I think, in many ways, doesn't have a very good way, it doesn't have very good ways of dealing with uh, computation as a topic or subject matter. It tends to sort of see it as something that is to be governed or something to be designed, but not, not as the actual form of governance itself. And so that's part of what we're trying to shift here. Um, I suppose in another way, perhaps in contrast to some um, first talk this morning, it's, it, it's not really not a utopian or dystopian story. I think it's sort of a bit of both um, and hopefully in some interesting and, and overlapping ways. Okay, so very quickly. Um, the two key arguments about planetary scale computation that the book tries to develop is one, that it distorts and deforms modern Westphalian logics of political geography, and it creates new territories in its own image. Second, that the various genres of computation, uh, of smart grids, cloud platforms, mobile apps, smart cities, Internet of Things, automation, should be seen not so much as, a, as a, but so many species evolving out on their own, but as something that is forming a coherent whole, an accidental megastructure called the stack that is both a computational apparatus and a new governing architecture at the same time. We are in it and it is in us. And so the architecture of this model uh, treats these overlapping layers, it's their claims and networks, not as exceptions to the, to the normal, but uh, exceptions to the rule, but as the basis of a, of a emergent order. And so, it, and as I'll very quickly go through in the structure of this talk, comprises these six interdependent layers of earth, cloud, city, address, interface, and user. But first, what do I mean exactly by this um, Westphalian political geography? Well, um, in a sense, we can say that the modern nation state was, among other things, uh, a function of a particular kind of cartographic projection that conceived of the earth as a horizontal plane filled with various allotments of land in which individual sovereign domains were circumscribed. And this topology um, became um, the standard form of uh, its, uh, the, geom the geometries of, of, of the political that would exist um, in, its, in its wake. But those loops, that loop topology gives way now to another kind of topology in geography, one, not a, one that is built of multiple totalities at once, layered on top of one another. Not one final last instant sovereignty, but multiple totalities. Some, sta some state-based, some extra state-based, some global, some regional, some modern, some archaic, all claiming the same site or person, a bit of data all at once. And it's not that somehow the state goes away into, into this, it virtualizes in some way, just as cloud platforms come to take on more roles traditionally assigned to modern states, so to the inverse, that states themselves evolve into cloud platforms. And so, in regard to the Alec Rosses and Jared Cohens of the world, the, the geopolitical domain is not, as they say, a chessboard with 196 pieces, one for each country. Rather, it's a stack, more like 196 squared heterogeneous jurisdictions, all fighting it out, one amongst the other. And so, the Earth layer, to start with. We assume that computation was discovered at least as much as it was invented, the first part, and that the, 
the stack as a whole draws upon the, 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 that computational capacity of the world, its energy and its mineral resources in order to compose itself and to drive the power of the layers above. Pulling not just silicon, but all other sort of matter of chemistry and energy, including the various heter heterogeneous minerals pulled from the mountain streams of central Africa. The stack terraforms its host planet by drinking and vomiting its elemental juices and spitting up mobile phones. The shiny surfaces of our handsets demand gore to feed the gloss of its face. One of the problems, I think, sometimes in talking about this, think there's a presumption when it was that some were talking about digital or computational technologies that were talking about something virtual, or Im ephemeral, immaterial. The stack in the cloud in particular is, is, is a physical, heavy, hungry beast, long ago past the airline industry and its total carbon footprint. But it's also something that we use in order to optimize and gain efficiencies in the types of energy that through networked electrons that it's possible to use to sustain our system. So, and this is, becomes the race. Can we build the stack fast enough to save us from the costs of building the stack? Um, this conundrum was made clear to me a couple years ago, and I was on a panel with a guy named Stanley Williams from HP, who was um, part of a panel by then Vice President Gore had, had commissioned to try to, to hypothesize what would the architecture of a computer that could model the entire world's climate in real time. What would it take to do this? And they came up with some estimates, it was zeta byte computation, it's a few orders of magnitude more than what we have. But the other sort of more anticlimactic aspect of this was that it was theoretically possible to build such a computer, but it would be roughly the size of Paris, and it would be the single most significant anthropogenic energy event that it itself would be modeling. <laughs> which is, in a nutshell, the, accidental, the accident of the Earth layer itself. So, to the cloud. The cloud, we sometimes think about these things as you know, placeless virtual geography and something. The cloud is in no way placeless. It has a geography. It's just a very weird one. The platforms of the cloud layer are structured by dense, plural, and non-contiguous geographies, a hybrid of USA super jurisdiction and the charter cities which would carve new partially privatized publics from the whole cloth of these sovereign lands. It's not a matter of borders just dis disappearing or virtualizing. It's more the multiplication, exponential multiplication of borders on one on top of another. This larger geographical and geopolitical drama is seen perhaps most explicitly in the ongoing Sino-Google conflicts of 2008 to the present. China hacking Google, Google pulling out of China, the NSA hacking China, the NSA hacking Google, Google ghostwriting books for the State Department, Google wordlessly circumventing the last instances of state oversight altogether, not by transgressing them, but by absorbing them into its service offering. Meanwhile, Chinese router firmware bides its time. And so between the hackers of the PLA and Google, there's more than, I think, a standoff between the proxies of two state apparatuses. There, there, it is instead two geometries of territory, one a subdivision of the horizontal, the other a stacking of vertical layers, one a state, the other a para-state, one superimposed on top of the other at any point on the map, never resolving into some consensual cosmopolitanism. The city layer. Some designers, architects, let's say, may see software as something added onto space. Um, they see the idea of smart cities as stupid because it assumes that cities are not already intelligent, and they're right. Some designers, programmers, let's say, may see cities as modules of hardware that fit together, one, one at a time, into, into that megastructural matrix, and they too are right. And so one mode of design is necessarily nested in the other. And in that nest, Homo sapien comes equipped with an extraordinary array of sensory faculties, which is, we may see are augmented further by synthetic layers in various ratios, ranging from the sensors and trackers in our phones that we carry about like mules to the more intimate media of artificial images and sounds. Situating ourselves in this expanded field, we are both sensors and sensed. On the one hand, we are a primary sapient actor in this drama, supervising an orchestra of sensing technologies each individually capable of functional processing and together of certain forms of intelligence, as are, for example, neurons or other cells. On the other, 
we're not only the subject of this scenario, we are also its subject matter. That wider urban landscape of synthetic sensory systems is not only a platform through which we extend and extrapolate our capacities for, for abstraction, it is also capable of other sorts of abstractions on its own. And so cities defined in this way, with perspectives mixed from both public, from perhaps public health planning and supply chain logistics, uh, are infrastructure for both living and non-living matter to consume itself and for some forms of matter to achieve and hone sentient intelligence, which in turn remake cities in its own image. In short, we should imagine something like an AI urbanism, a bit like a stroll into the field populated by mutually oblivious little life worlds, or in terms of like the world of the tick, the ladder waiting, laying in wait for some threshold event to come its way, at which point it triggers its programmed responses at and into the void, its own little void into which it leaps. Many of our own, many of our urban sensors and their limited forms of AI work similarly and perhaps with similar nobility. More versatile synthetic intelligences occupy more complex umwelt. Some are predator, some are prey, some are in motion, some are flowering, some pollinating. And as we stroll among them, we may be registered by them or we may be ignored. We may be the primary cause of concern or we may be a passing interference in an evolutionary dynamic in which we are neither protagonist nor target. And so through this nesting, the city layer of the stack is then also the home for an urban scale AI, a commingling of diverse sensors of light and air and sound and chemistry, drawing a landscape of sensing and thinking little species, partially embodied discreetly one with another and partially co-embodied one with another as their information inputs are aggregated and modeled and act upon, acted upon in various pluralities. The AI city may be embodying itself but not as humans do. And so it's not just the AI in the city, but nested AI embodied as the city with very different kinds of organiz organism to population, to genome, to niche, to signal morphologies at work. The work of abstraction then for art and design, or urbanism is then not just to employ, deploy abstract forms, but to set in motion mechanisms and programs that are capable of their own feats of abstraction and to calibrate how they abstract us and one another accordingly. To the address layer very, qu very quickly. Swirling just a bit closer to the top of our stack image, we see that any instance, singular or plural, of matter, a particle, or wave, or relation, is potentially identified by massive universal addressing systems in which mapping and linking tool provide for Avogadro's number of addresses allotted to every user. The global credential of the address then subdivides these heterogeneous territories, hard and soft, Hertzian space and carbon space, into disintegrated communicative arrays, an atmospheric metropolis built of digit strings. For something to appear to the stack, that is, it must be addressed. Its position is then both a mapping problem and a set theory problem. IPv6, for example, as we know, allows in principle something like 128-bit address strings, something like 10 to the 23 addresses per person. Uh, obviously not entirely. In, in, in exploring sort of what the granularity, material granularity of this would imply, um, in my lab at UCSD a few years ago, we were interested in, in how small of an IP address could you uh, could you make? If, you, if in principle you, you know, you're working down to a granularity of cells and molecules of what could be addressed, can we actually even write an address at this scale? And so you'd need this, the finest point pen um, that there is. Um, and so we wrote this IP address with an electron lithography beam into a silicon wafer, uh, photographed it with scanning electronic microscope. The, the address in the picture is about 10 micrometers in width, which is about the size of a red blood cell. Um, each digit about uh, 40 to 50 nanometers in thickness. But obviously, actually in terms of, we'd have to go much smaller than this in terms of for it to really work for practically for nanomedicine and things. The interface 
we could define an interface basically in, in general sense as, as, as any point of contact between two complex systems which governs the condition of exchange between those systems. Our, our, our pr predominant genre of the interface for today is the graphical user interface, buttons with words on it. And so we've become, in one way or another, a species of button pushers. It's how we interact with the stack and how the stack interacts with us. The complexity of the stack, all the things that you might do with it and it might do with you through any one interfacial point is too complex to comprehend. And so we require, by necessity, these synthetic summary maps of all of the possibilities, which are those interfacial diagrams that show us where things are and what can be done with them. They provide both signification and a framing of significance in this regard. And so as the interfaces multiply one on the other, they assemble into interfacial regimes which present and enforce these diagrammatic total images and, for, and frame how it is the platform can work for any user who perceives that platform through the grammar of this regime. As far as shifting to AR and VR and AR in particular, I, I, I fear that ultimately a less um, secular danger than at pervasive advertising is latent in AR and that its most killer app may not be marketing but fundamentalist religion. AR promises the design of a kind of differential sacrality whereby the black-white, black versus white theological segmentation of the polis into friend and enemy becomes a direct literal annotation onto the life world, the subtitling of perception of into things into clean and unclean, ours and theirs, sacred and profane, rebel and empire forces, orc and not orc, red team, blue team. But that's not the only path uh, we might take. It also may allow for forms of empathetic cinematic co-experience we can scarcely imagine today, allowing for co-embodied users across locations and for the induction and deduction of far more complex energy flows, such as between energy and currency, um, into more of a matter of course. There's a sort of quick shout out to this, because we have for CEO here, um, company of, uh, that I'm involved with, a startup from our lab at UCSD called NanoVR. Um, is a VR-based nano engineering design platform that allows you to draw upon existing geom geometric structures um, with the very accurate molecular imaging uh, geometries or start from scratch to build atom by atom uh, new proteins, molecules, and to simulate their interactions. Uh, it was developed, as I said, lab at UCSD with the Scripps Research Institute Molecular Graphics Laboratory. Um, would, in principle, allow anything that involves visualization of, of complex interactions at this scale. And not just for scientists, it was starting with the table of elements instead of the brick, anybody who could build 3D in Minecraft um, can now make complex nanobiotechnological forms in VR. And so the script kitty extinction event is nigh. <laughs> um, uh, lastly, to the user. We require, I think, um, a rather more fundamental and difficult, I'm sure, redefinition of the political subjectivity of the user in relationship to its real operations because what it does, what we already do with it, let alone what it's going to do, is much weirder than our current vocabulary will allow for. And that's because platforms, and I argue that the stack is a platform, not all platforms are stacks. Platforms don't ultimately care if a user is animal, vegetable, or mineral. All users have platform sovereignty. In, in security speak, a user is credentialized by three qualifications, something you know, like a password, something you are, like a fingerprint, and something you have, or something you have, like a key card. And so if someone or something can be, have, and or know, it can be a user. A trading algorithm, driverless car, a sans papier arrivé, a chemical reaction, triggering a threshold event in an environmental sensor, embedded on a leaf in a rainforest, all users. Platforms don't care if the state sees you as an illegal immigrant or if the market sees you as an externality. And so while this stage is a certain kind of death of the humanist user, in one sense, the eclipse of a certain resolute humanism, it does so because it also brings the multiplication and proliferation of other kinds of non-human and inhuman or exo-human users, including sensors and alcos, the robots from nanometric to landscape scale any combination of which one might enter into in relationship as part of a composite user, any of us that is. 
which brings us, of course, to AlphaGo and Deep Dream. Um, the most interesting, I think, sort of challenge of the latter is, is not just to sort of, you know, admire its handiwork, but also to sort of empathetically attempt in a way to see as it sees and to think of AI in a way that goes beyond the, the kind of Turing test prejudices of assuming that an AI is, is recognizably intelligent to the extent that it will perform intelligence in the way in which humans think that humans think. Um, also, we could say that if Deep Dream's images are artifacts of the computer's hallucinations of phantom conclusions, then the conspiratorial figure cut by the evil Google stepfather is perhaps that same paranoid vision turned inside out and back on itself. Perhaps Google, the AI, is as paranoid in how it sees us as some of us are in how we see it. It's not coincidental then that as AI matures, its own pattern recognition faculties would reach the plateau of a creative apophenia, so important to our own pattern, uh, our own evolution and pattern recognition. Now, dealing with the fact that the platform user position undermines the primacy of hu human agency will inevitably drive uh, strong pushback. One can expect the pushback to be in some ways as fervent as it is irrational. There are some affinities with technologies, however fictitious or bizarre they may be, that are thought to embody the essence of a creationist order. One of these is food, especially for the left, um, or personal mastery over equipment, and um, among these is the car. And I, I, based on some conversations with some colleagues I've you know, spoken with at, at uh, um, working on various autonomous vehicle projects, uh, and from the legal standpoint, I, I don't think it would be so surprising if we were to a movement to identify human-driven automobiles as a type of arms and that the Second Amendment to the Constitution, now used to shield gun owners from obvious liabilities and to protect the owner's sense of personal dominion, will be flown to keep human beings behind steering wheels. Your life may be ended by someone encased in a two-ton steel box careening down the asphalt vista, trying to prove a point about how technology will never capture his natural humanity. I'll conclude then with some thoughts then, as I said, on the stack we have and a bit on what I, it, in the book called The, the Black Stack, um, the generic figure for all of the alternate totalities to come. Um, stacks are, of course, designed to be, have the, everything to be replaced on each later. They are modular. They are a kind of Theseus paradox infrastructure. The, the stack we have is that's thus defined not only by its form, its layers and platforms and their interrelations, but also by its its content, and is now painfully clear, leak after leak, that its content is also the content of our daily communications now weaponized against us. Still, Copernican traumas that abolish the false centrality and specialness of human thought and species being are priceless accomplishments. And the advent of robust inhuman AI and the geopolitics that could ensue from it were we willing to compose it, will provide for similar disenchantments, ones that should enable a more reality-based understanding of ourselves or situation and a fuller and more complex understanding of what intelligence is and is not. From there, we can hopefully make our world with a greater confidence that our models are good approximations of what's out there. Always a helpful thing. That is to say, the Anthropocene it's not just about the reign of humans, it's about a reign of a particular kind of humanism. And to survive it, we must graduate beyond the notion, I argue, that human, the human experience of human experience is A, the central purpose of a world given there for us, and B, something that is separate from our own biotechnological evolutionary emergence, which is, of course, ongoing. And, it, and so my critique then is not of humans, my, as I say, some of my best friends are humans. It's, um, it's of, the, it's of the, a particular humanist hangover, a, a folk psychology that weaves fake asceticism, populist solipsism, and various naturalistic fallacies into a political aesthetics. To me, it is the theologic expression of a mode of global dwelling that sees the world as here for us. And this, to me, this human exceptionalism is the exact recipe of the Anthropocene. And it, what it um, 
it makes it far too difficult uh, for us to see that the geo design project that we really have at our uh, at, on our table more as is what it should be. It it is more like molecular gastronomy at landscape scale. A restored and resorted ecology designed to taste itself in new forms of richly spiced and imaginatively sauced mutual ingestion. And per then our specific situation, if the panopticon effect is when you don't know you are being watched or not and so behave as if you are, then the inverse panopticon effect is when you know you're being watched but act as if you aren't. This is today's surveillance culture, exhibitionism in bad faith. The emergence of stack platforms doesn't promise any solution or even distinctions between friend and enemy in, within this optics. When considered versus the Google Caliphate, perhaps the NSA may even come to be seen by some as the public option. At least it's accountable in principle to some parliamentary limits, they may say rather than merely stakeholder avarice or flimsy user agreements. If we take 9-11 and the rollout of the Patriot Act as the year zero for the USA's massive data gathering, encapsulation and digestion campaign, one that we're only now beginning to comprehend even as parallel projects in China and Russia and Europe come to light, then we should imagine the entirety of network communications for this last decade, the big haul, as a single deep and wide digital simulation of the world or a significant section of it. It's an archive, a library of the real. Its existence as the purloined property of the state, just as a physical fact, is almost a cult, almost. The geophilosophical profile of the big hall, from the energy necessary to preserve it, to its governing instrumentality, understood as, a, a, as a, a, a text, a very large text, and as a machine with various utilities, overflows the traditional politics of software. Its story is much more Borges than Lawrence Lessig. And its fate is as well. Can it be destroyed? Is it possible to delete this simulation, and is it even desirable to do so? Is there a trash can big enough for the big delete. Even if the plug could be pulled on all future data halls, stopping it immediately, surely there must be a backup somewhere, the identical double of the simulation, such that if we delete one, the other will be forever haunting history until it's rediscovered by future AI archaeologists interested in their own Paleolithic origins. Would we bury it, even if we could? Would we need signs around it, like those designed for the Yucca Mountain Nuclear Waste Disposal Site, warning off unknowable future excavations? Those of us lucky enough to be alive during this 15-year span would enjoy then a certain illegible immortality, curious to whatever metacognitive entity pieces us back together by our online activities, both public and private, proud and furtive, each of us rising back centuries from now, each of us a little Ozymandias of cat videos and Pornhub. <laughs> for some dramas, but hopefully not for the fabrication of the stack to come, black or otherwise, a certain humanism and a companion figure of humanity still presumes its traditional place in the center of the frame. We must let go of the demand that synthetic intelligence arriving at sentience or sapience in whatever way must care deeply about humanity, us specifically as the subject an object of its knowing its, and its desire. The real nightmare, worse than the, the one in which the big machine wants to, sorry, I wanted to start this. The worst nightmare, worse than the one in which the big machine wants to kill you, is the one in which it sees you as irrelevant, not even as a discrete thing to know. Worse than being seen as an enemy is not being seen at all. Or as Elizir Yudakowski puts it, the AI does not hate you, it does not love you, but you are made out of atoms that it can use for something else. And so, one of the inter integral accidents, essential accidents of the stack may be an anthracidal trauma 
that shifts us from the design career as the authors of the Anthropocene to the role of supporting actors in the arrival of the post-Anthropocene. The sect to come may also be black because we cannot see our own reflection in it. In the last instance, its accelerationist geopolitics is less eschatological than chemical because its grounding of time is based less on the premise of historical dialectics than on the rot of isotope decay. It's drawn, I believe, by an inhuman and inhumanist molecular form finding. Pre-Cambrian flora changed into peat oil, changed into children's toys, dinosaurs changed into birds, changed into ceremonial headdresses. Computation itself converted into whatever meta-machine comes next and stack into stack to come. Thank you. <laughs>